It's so good to see all of you this morning. Uh, before we get into the word, I have a couple really important announcements today. And uh, normally I don't uh, flex my position as lead, lead pastor often, but today I'm going to flex it a little bit. As lead pastor, I want to reiterate what Pastor Katie just said about our congregational meeting. If you call Quest home, especially if you are a member of this church, if you call Quest home, if you find a sense of belonging in this space, if you leave this space on a Sunday or from joining us online and you say, God, I love that church. You need to be a part of this congregational meeting, whether you join us here in person or online. The reality is no organization, no family, no individual functions well without knowing what you have, what you need, and what's required of us in order to be sustainable and more importantly, to thrive. Now this meeting, I'm gonna let you know, it's all about finances. I was just invited to a newer Questers home last night for dinner. So generous. So good. And anytime, I don't know about you, anytime that I'm invited over to somebody's house, even as a guest, the first thing I text back is, I would love to, and what can I bring? I hope that you will come to this meeting, not only to listen, but to come with that posture, what can I bring? Amen? And I trust that you will do that. Uh, the second thing is, uh, beginning next Sunday, I have the gift and the privilege and the honor of taking some time to rest, recuperate, on a sabbatical. The beautiful thing at Quest, and this has been throughout the history of Quest, the lead pastor usually every three years, because of the burden of leadership, has been extended a two to three month sabbatical to rest. Understanding and acknowledging that the work that is, that is held together on behalf of this church is hard, is laborious, and we all know we, it, we don't have to look far that the last several years have been heavy, and especially as a multi-church. And so thank you, Quest, first and foremost, for extending that privilege to be able to take the next 10 weeks off. And I'll tell you this, I can only take these next 10 weeks off because we already have a team of leaders in our staff, in our pastors, in our elders, in our deacons, in all of you who volunteer week after week, who serve, who show up, who give. That's the only way I'm able to go and rest. And you are in good hands. You've always been in good hands. Even this morning, Pastor Aaron was asking me, hey, do you want to, whatever you think is best. So you actually have more than one leader here at Quest. You always have. We have a team of phenomenal and incredible leaders. And so to you all, thank you. And during this time of sabbatical, um, I'm excited for you as our church to be able to, to experience the preaching and the teaching from a few guest preachers. In a couple weeks, um, we'll be inviting Pastora Inez Velasquez McBride back again, a good friend of Quest from Pasadena. Uh, at the end of August, you'll hear from Pastor Mark Chase from All Saints Episcopal Church, phenomenal, dynamic preacher uh, and leader and a friend of Quest as well. And then our very own in September, when we launch our values series, our very own Reverend Andy Larson will uh, uh, lead us off as he situates us around the, the value of global presence. So I'm so excited. Alongside of our team of preachers, you will be in good hands. So I, I wanna encourage you to continue to come out through the summer to be filled with the goodness of God, amen? 
Amen. Let's get into the word. Today, our text comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. And I'll be reading it from the Common English Translation this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. Don't even begin to think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said, to those who lived long ago, don't commit murder. And all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. If they say to their brother or sister, you idiot, they will be in danger of being condemned by the governing council. And if they say, you fool, they will be in danger of fiery hell. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First, make things right with your brother or sister and then come back and offer your gift. Be sure to make friends quickly with your opponents while you are with them on the way to court. Otherwise, they will haul you before the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer of the court and you will be thrown into prison. I say to you in all seriousness that you won't get out of there until you've paid the very last penny. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The title of my message today is Catch the Pattern, Engage the Process. Catch the Pattern, Engage the Process. Gracious and living God, I thank you for these words that I believe you have deposited into my spirit, my heart, my body, my mind. And so, God, I pray that you would breathe afresh. I pray for your anointing to move. I pray that you would also open our eyes, ears, and hearts to see here and receive all that you would have to speak to us today. This I pray and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. What if I told you that one of the key identifiers of being a faithful follower of Jesus is in how we handle scripture or the word of God? What if I told you that? We're continuing in this series on the Sermon on the Mount, and for those not familiar, this teaching and sermon of Jesus is found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And we've walked through the Beatitudes already, and today we're still in chapter 5, picking up where Dr. Brian left off last week, as he helped the disciples, or as he... Um, uh, last week when Brian helped the, uh, talked about how Jesus helped the disciples make the turn from the Beatitudes toward their very identity as salt and light. If you didn't hear that message, I really encourage you to do so. My assignment this week, though, was to exegete the passage on murder. And I'll touch on it in a few moments, but as I looked at the rest of the chapter, this whole first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, the whole thing, it started to draw my attention to what I believe is one of the most neglected teachings of Jesus. And I want to contend with you today that what happens at the end of Matthew 5 should challenge the way we read and use scripture and how we handle God's word with humility and integrity. And the reason why I'm choosing to focus on this today is because the next time I'm in this pulpit, we will be in the throes of what is already a volatile political reality. And I know that some of you will be navigating conversations with family members and loved ones around various issues and what the Bible says about all of it. So Jesus begins the passage we just read by sharing with the disciples that his desire for them is that their righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law or the legal experts, the scribes. 
And we know that they were the religious leaders of Jesus' day whose primary assignment was to read, to interpret, and adjudicate the law of Israel for the Jewish people during that time. You have to remember that the people Jesus was teaching to, many of them were dependent on the Pharisees and the scribes, the legal experts, to read the scriptures, to give them the interpretation of what was written, and to instruct them how to live according to what the scripture said. And the issue at stake for Jesus is how scripture is handled. So he says to them, listen, I need you to have a righteousness righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the teachers of the law. Translation, I need my followers to handle the word of God differently than the Pharisees and the scribes do. And that's important for us to understand because I would argue that the Bible might be the most dangerous book in recorded history. History has proven that if you can identify any evil in humanity, any atrocity we commit against one another, any systemic and systematic oppression of a group of people, somewhere, somehow, somebody use scripture to justify it. The Bible has been used as a weapon to limit life in the kingdom of God. Look at any evil in recent history and you'll more than likely find some scripture in it. Slavery, anti-blackness, sexism, controlling women's bodies, violence against the queer community, abuse of children, stealing land and claiming that God told them this is their promised land, anti-immigration policies, xenophobia, the Holocaust, you name it. And in it all, somebody used the three most deadly words. The Bible says. And with those three words, there are those who would persuade you that whatever evil they are up to, whatever atrocities they're committing, as long as you can find a scripture to support it, God must be behind it. And I hope you know that that's dangerous. Because if you don't know how to read rightly, you can make the Bible say whatever you want the Bible to say. You can use scripture to justify violence against what you think is other people's sin. And you can use scripture to justify your own sin. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. So watch what Jesus teaches. He says to them, verse 17, I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. The law, that's a reference to the first five books of the Bible. The prophets are a reference to Joshua through Kings and then Isaiah through Malachi. So when Jesus puts together the term law and the prophets, he's talking about Genesis through Deuteronomy, Joshua through 2 Kings and Isaiah through Malachi. Ron, that's the bulk of the scriptures that the Jews had at the time. So Jesus says, I didn't come to dismiss your word. I didn't come to destroy the scripture. I didn't come to dismantle your understanding of the word. But he says, I've come to fulfill it. The word fulfill in the Greek literally means to add weight to something, to stabilize or anchor something that is moving around too much. This is what Jesus says. Listen, you've heard the word of God, but only You've heard only the Pharisees' version of it. So I've come to fulfill it and to give some weight to it so that you understand how to read it rightly, how to use it correctly, how to apply it appropriately. Because what you're hearing from the scribes and the Pharisees is not always complete. We can't live as Christians without the word of God. Beware of anybody that tells you they don't need the Bible. Because it's necessary. We can't know God's will without God's word. We can't know what it means to be in relationship with God, bearing witness to God's relationship with God's people throughout history. But at the same time, it's a dangerous book. So in our text today, Jesus is teaching them how to use something that's dangerous. Okay, let me explain it in a different way. So many of you know that I was a musician growing up. 
And as a conducting major, you have to learn how to play lots of different instruments. And sometimes you have to kind of pick one main or primary instrument. And the instrument that I really found intriguing over the years was the bassoon. So if you don't know what a bassoon is, you could take out your phone and just Google it real quick. <laughs> but it has a double reed. It's like a long, and it has a double reed. And professional bassoon players, if you want to become a bassoon player, you have to actually make your own. You could buy your reed at the store, but most bassoon players, they make their own reed. And so they have classes on how to make your own reeds. And there's all kinds of presents. There's all kinds of tools and knives and planes. And it, it comes in a stalk, a, a reed. And you have to cut it up to create two pieces to wrap it together. And every little carving determines how it plays. Right? So there's all kinds of classes on how to do all kinds of things. And there's one introductory class that you have to take before you take any other class, whether it's wrapping it with different kinds of string and techniques. You can't sign up for any other class until you take the introductory class. And do you know what that introductory class is? Knife skills. The very first course you've got to pass before you can learn to make reeds is Knife skills. Why? Because the knife is the most dangerous instrument in your workshop. And if you don't know how to hold a knife correctly, if you don't know how to use a knife correctly, not only will you not know how to craft your reed correctly, but you're going to cut some things too deep and leave some things bleeding because you don't know how to handle the most dangerous weapon in your workshop. Jesus in Matthew 5 is teaching us how to hold the most dangerous weapon in our Christian arsenal so that we know how to use it correctly and we'll stop cutting people with the word of God that is meant to help and heal people in their time of distress. This thing is dangerous. But if you know how to use it correctly, it can produce beautiful possibilities and breathe life and not death. So Jesus wants to teach us how to use scripture rightly. And he does it not in what he says, but how he says it. So if you read verse 21 through 48 and take a step back, you'll see that there's actually a pattern that repeats itself six times from verse 21 to verse 48. And I'm going to let you know that anytime the Bible gives you a pattern that shows up six times, the Bible is begging for you to pay attention to it. This pattern has three part structure. Watch how Jesus speaks throughout the rest of chapter five. Jesus says this, you've heard it said, he then references a scripture that they all know as part of the law because they heard it from the scribes and the Pharisees. And number three, then Jesus says, but I say unto you. And then he gives an expanded interpretation that is meant to fulfill or anchor the word they already had. What Jesus is doing is lifting up a scripture and contrasting how the religious leaders have interpreted it and then how he interprets it. Don't miss it. It's right here in verse 21. You've heard it said. Then he quotes Exodus 20 verse 13 about murder. And then verse 22, Jesus says, but I say to you, and he gives another interpretation of the word. Verse 27, you've heard it said. He then quotes Exodus 20, 14 about adultery. Then verse 28, he says, but I say to you, and he gives weight to the interpretation. Verse 31, it has been said, he then quotes a scripture from Deuteronomy 24, 1 about divorce. And then verse 32, he says, but I say to you and gives an interpretation to fulfill it. Verse 33, you've heard it said Then he makes reference of not a scripture, but a common saying of the Pharisees about making promises. And then verse 34, he gives another interpretation to fulfill it and says, but I say to you, verse 38, you've heard it said, then he quotes the scriptures, an eye for an eye, which comes from Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. And then he turns right back around in verse 39 and says, but I say to you, verse 43, you've heard it said, then he quotes a scripture from Leviticus 19 about loving your neighbor and hating your enemy. And then he fulfills that scripture by putting weight on it, giving it a different interpretation in verse 44 saying, but I say unto you, I hope you see the pattern. I hope you don't miss it. 
It happened six times, and that's intentional. You've heard it said. Here's a scripture. Now let me fulfill it by giving you a different understanding so that your understanding is anchored in who I am. Now, I won't be here for this, but as we make our way into the next chapters, I hope our preachers will also pay attention to chapters 6 and the beginning of chapter 7. Again, six times, Jesus will say, don't be blank, and then we'll give a different way to imagine it. Don't be showy when you give to the poor, but instead, don't be a hypocrite when you pray, but instead, and so on. Six times. you got to pay attention to the pattern. Catch the pattern. Can I leave some practical tools with you? And I'll share four things that I want us to grasp when it comes to reading and handling scripture, a, a kind of process of how to read. Number one, all scripture is interpreted. It's subject to interpretation. How Jesus engages his followers in this chapter is a reminder, it should be a reminder, that all scripture is interpreted by the one who reads it. So when somebody comes to you and says to you, the Bible says, what they're really sharing with you is their interpretation of what the Bible says, right? Jesus lifts up a verse, then he says, this is how the Pharisees have read it, but this is how I read it. Let's just say we both read Psalm 23, verse 4. Let's just say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Many of us know this. You and I can read the same scripture and walk away with a different understanding based on our experiences, our age, our social location, and so on. Because you and I are different people. What is read is shaped by who's reading it. The interpreter infects the interpretation. Where you've been will determine what you see. What you're going through determines what you hear. Who you are affects what God is saying to you. Your interpretation is based on where you are in life. You know, there was a chaplain at a pediatric oncology unit that once said to my seminary cohort, you can only see from where you stand. And where you stand and are stationed in life determines what you see or don't see in scripture. Right, so if I take Psalm 23 as an example, that was one of the chapters that we had to memorize as a kid, as a pastor's kid. We had to memorize it. So I remember at eight years old, we'd have to recite it in children's church, and you'd get a sticker. <laughs> Though I walk, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. At that time, you know, maybe it was a book report that I had to say in front of the class that I was scared about. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the, I will fear no evil. <laughs> right? Yeah. But let me tell you something. As life moves on, yeah. and life be life in, yeah. Yeah. and you go through some things, interpretations evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Words carry different meaning. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference between Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil when I was eight, getting ready to do a book report in front of the class. And as I sat next to my mother, about to breathe her last breath, and I'm reading, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. As the young people say, it just hits different. The interpreter infects the interpretation. Now, since scripture demands interpretation, the second thing Jesus teaches us is that scripture should be interpreted in conversation within a multiplicity of voices and perspectives. You and I can read the same passage and walk away with different understandings and rather than fight about who's right or who's wrong, we ought to listen to each other because the fullest reading of scripture happens in conversation. The danger of only listening to your own voice is that you might be wrong. And just because you're passionate doesn't mean you're right. 
just because you're convicted about it doesn't mean you read it the right way. This is actually really important as we make our way through this series. It's the reason why you're going to hear a sermon on adultery and divorce next week from a preacher who's never been married and divorced. And it's intentional. Because I believe you need to hear more than what you heard in your own closet. You need to be in a community of interpretation that helps you imagine more. You with me? Third thing. Jesus shares with us that scripture is always deeper than you think or than it appears. There's always more to it than what you think you saw. It's kind of like seeing a mound of dirt that a mole dug up. Or I'm just learning about voles. That part you see is not all that is there. I'm just learning that my backyard underneath these mounds of dirt is a whole ecosystem of tunnels of rats and moles and voles that you cannot see. Scripture has layers. Scripture has depth. Scripture has meaning that goes beyond what you read in that one verse. So watch what Jesus does. He says, you've heard it said. He then lifts up a scripture and says, but I say to you. He said, listen, the scripture here, it's a literal, the literal re reading is you shall not murder. Yes, okay. Then he says, but there's much more to it than that. Your first encounter with what's written, that's just the beginning. A literal interpretation is not a fulfilled interpretation. Anybody can quote the words verbatim, but there's more to it than the words you just read. So watch what Jesus does and gives an example. Jesus says, you've heard it said. He then lifts up Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, which says, you shall not murder. And that comes from the Ten Commandments. Then Jesus goes on and on about what that scripture really means. Don't miss it. The Pharisees have just said, you shall not commit murder. Literal reading. Jesus then adds his understanding. He says, okay, this scripture is not only about murder. Because actually it means you shouldn't even be angry with each other. In fact, if you get angry with somebody, you ought to reconcile with them. As a matter of fact, don't even think about handling this, these disagreements in a court of law, but reconcile your differences on the way to court. So Jesus is saying, you shall not commit murder. And then he ends his interpretation by saying, if you're angry with another brother or sister and you come to church, don't you dare open your mouth to sing or come in here trying to give your tithes or offer your prayers and praise until you find that person whom you've got an issue with and y'all resolve it because your offering of worship is not acceptable in anger. Now, if I were in that crowd and Jesus just quoted Exodus 20, 13 saying, you shall not murder. And then he ends by saying, this is how you ought to give your offering. I'm going to sit there and wonder how in the world did we get from murder to offering? Because there's depth to it. That it's not just a literal reading, right? Murder is a way to get justice for the things we lost or want to protect. People usually murder because they think they're entitled to something and don't want to lose it. Using any means necessary to maintain or regain it or to somehow protect what they might lose at the expense of somebody else's life. Murder or the attempt to murder or even the desire that someone be harmed out of the depths of our anger is never the answer to a problem, no matter how great that problem may be. And what Jesus is saying here is, how can you say you love me and worship me, someone you cannot see, if you have no regard for the life of those you can see right in front of you? Come on, dig deeper, PG. Murder isn't just about the taking of someone's bodied life. 
You can murder someone's spirit. You can kill someone's joy. You can destroy someone's dreams. You can limit someone's opportunity. Anger, jealousy, fear, envy, pride, entitlement can all lead to murder. Pro-life is inclusive. I'm going to need us to catch this because in the coming weeks, Our preachers are going to elaborate on some of these hard issues that Jesus names, like adultery and divorce, on making promises, on loving your enemies. It's not just a literal reading. That when you sit and wrestle with these things, there's so much more there. And we got to do the work to get to the depth of what God is saying or to get to the spirit of what God is uttering, to get to the heart of the matter, to show that God is saying so much more than the words themselves. But in order to go deeper, not only must we be open, but we've got to be willing to do the hard work. Can I preach right here? A literal reading of scripture is easy. It takes hard work to go deeper. It takes hard work of putting aside your assumptions and reading it again to see what it says and does not say. It takes hard work to ask ourselves, how does this fit in with the image of God I already know? It takes hard work of asking, who is harmed by my reading of scripture? Who is left out by my interpretation? Who am I biased against? Who have I not heard? It takes hard work of putting yourself in different people's position reading from the perspective of different characters in the Bible it's always easier to read the Bible from the perspective of the one who conquered who defeated the enemy who crossed over and led the masses but it's harder to read the Bible from the perspective of those who are abused those who've been taken advantage of those who've been left out those who've not been considered those who haven't been heard those who haven't been identified with the name you've got to read it from all angles to get to the depth of it and that's hard work and the Bible will always be dangerous in lazy hands somebody say do the hard work work. scripture is interpreted it must be interpreted in conversation scripture is always deeper than you think and here's the fourth thing that Jesus teaches and then I'm done Scripture should always be read through the lens of love. Through the lens of Jesus Christ's love. Remember, I launched this whole Sermon on the Mount series within the context of love. Home with others is a demonstration of the great commandment to love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's about love and love, not because it's easy, but because there's going to come a time as a follower of Jesus when a decision to love will need to be made. So what Jesus is saying here to the listeners is that I'm expanding the law that you know. You've heard it said, but I say, that it should be read through the lens of my love. And we'll get to this in a few weeks, but the last chapter of chapter five is about love. Jesus ends this chapter talking about love because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much scripture you know, it's how much love you have. And if you try to handle the word of God without love in your heart, you're always gonna misunderstand it and you're always gonna misuse it. You can't use the word of God with hate in your heart and judgment in your mind and condemnation in your mouth. Christians have gotta stop using the Bible to say who's going to hell and start using the Bible to help people find their way to heaven. Stop using the Bible to suffocate people to death, but to use the Bible to breathe life into death dealing realities. You must use the Bible in love toward the possibility of life. Beloveds, don't ever allow yourself to be bothered by someone who quotes the Bible but hasn't opened their heart to the love of Jesus Christ. You know, over the years, I've met with many people who have wanted to argue things they believed to be in Scripture that was contrary to something I had preached about or mentioned. 
And I've always said in those encounters that I'm not arguing Leviticus with you until I know you understand Jesus. We're not going to talk about these laws until you understand grace. We're not going to talk about who's going to hell until you recognize that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. We're not going to talk about that until you understand that by grace are we saved through faith. It is not of our works lest any of us boast, but it is the grace of God. I can't argue with you until you understand that wherever sin abounds, grace abounds that much more and that the love of God is greater than my sin and the love of God is greater than my mistake. Do you understand what God did in the incarnation? Do you understand what Jesus did throughout his life and ministry on earth? Do you understand the gravity of what happened on the cross? Because if you don't get the cross right, you'll never read Chronicles right. If you don't understand Jesus, then Genesis is going to mess you up. If you don't understand God's grace, Galatians shouldn't even be read yet. It starts with the lens of the love of Jesus Christ. And I reject any reading that is not rooted in the love of God made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. All scripture is interpreted. Scripture should be read in conversation. It's deeper than what you think. And if it doesn't enhance the love of Jesus Christ, you're mishandling it in dangerous ways. Let me be done here. I wonder if Jesus' interpretation of the law here You've heard it said, do not murder, but I say, don't even be angry. Leave your worship at the altar and make things right with your neighbor and reconcile your differences with those who accuse you on your way to court. Do you understand the gravity of that call? I wonder, could it be that this is what the Beatitudes were laying out for us all along. What if we hungered for God's righteousness and not our own when something infuriates us? What if we took the posture of extending mercy when you've been wronged? Or a peacemaker when chaos and injustice continues to suffocate? Blessed are you. Love. Not because it's easy. But because it's a decision we're going to have to make every day. This, beloveds, is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Will you join me? Especially as we together walk through this next season. I pray that Quest would live into its identity made in the image of God. That wherever you find yourselves from Monday through Saturday, in your workplaces, within your families, in your friend circles, with your neighbors, that love would be at the forefront of who you are, how you see God, how you see yourself, and how you see others. Quest, may it be so. So God, thank you for this reminder today. Sometimes these words, your words are hard. Not only to wrap our minds around, but to allow it to go deep and be seated deep in the recesses of our hearts. And I want to acknowledge that when people make us angry, when the injustice all around us seems impossible to overcome, 
when we're at the brink of perhaps losing hope in humanity. God, help us to stay humble. Help us to return to your word. A word when read in love reminds us of your life, your goodness, your generosity, your hope, your mercy, your grace that abounds, that is lavish, and that has no end. And so, God, I pray for Quest over these next 10 weeks. God, I pray for our leaders. I pray for our staff, our elders, our pastors, our deacons, our volunteers. I pray for protection, protection of body, mind, heart, and spirit. I pray that you would encourage their hearts. Thank you for their leadership. Thank you for their yes. I pray for our church. I pray for generosity to abound. I pray for flourishing. I pray for courage and not fear. Opportunity and possibility and not defeat. And so God, help us to walk boldly in our identity as salt and light with every person that we encounter in our words and in how we show up to and for one another. And so God, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that this is your church. Have your way, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.